So here's the numerical example, uh, example that I talked about. And here are the coefficients that are in this plot. And it looks kind of symmetric, but it's not exactly symmetric. Uh, there's certainly the uh, main uh, impulse there, and then uh, others, and, and there are the, the numbers for them. And uh, they can see the uh, coefficients for each one of these uh, impulses we see in the plot. So the first thing I'm going to do when I try to construct my zero forcing equalizer is I'm going to uh, construct this matrix for the channel. And remember, on the diagonal was the uh, main path on the desired one. So that would be, uh, you can see it here in purple, it's the value of 1. And you can see that's the value that we see here. And then if I looked over the uh, P of minus T, it would have been 0.2. I see the 0.2 here, etc. And remember, I said that each row, I'm, I'm shifting to the right, and I'm introducing you know, one of the other coefficients, etc. I said I decided here I'm going to just do three taps, which is why there's just the three columns and three rows in this uh, matrix. So one thing I'd like to point out is the structure of this matrix. So you'll notice that all of the values on the diagonal are constant, and that's true for all the subdiagonals as well. Well, it comes directly from the definition of this matrix, the, the construction of this matrix. I do this shift, and so that sort of uh, assures that I've always got these constants. Now, this uh, form has a name. A matrix that has constants along the diagonals and subdiagonals is called a topless matrix. And a topless matrix is interesting because there are all kinds of numerical routines on how to efficiently invert this matrix. So the cost, the comput computational cost of inverting this matrix is much less than it would be if this was an arbitrary uh, matrix without the structure of having constants on the diagonal. Because, remember, the first step to find out what, is the, what are the coefficients for the zero-forcing equalizer is to find the inverse for this matrix. So numerically, we can go to MATLAB, find the inverse, and we get this result. And if you recall, when I look at this, I'm going to take this matrix, I'm going to multiply by this uh, uh, delta function in a vector, and uh, the knowledge of the channel gave me the ability to invert this. And when I multiply by it, I'm going to get the filter coefficients. But again, remember, that's just pulling out what is the center column of this matrix. So now I know what filter coefficients to use to equalize this channel. So here it is, the equalizer output, where I've put the coefficients of the uh, terms. And now, of course, I can plug in the values for the channel. And so what will I get in the end? Do I really get my... Um, nice delta function. Well, first of all, it's pretty clear that I get the one here on the main, uh, the main output at time equals zero. And if I look at the um, output on either side, I get zero because those are the three taps and it worked perfectly. I got my one, got my zero, got my zero. Of course, there are going to be influences from the uh, other terms, which I neglected because my matrix was only 3 by 3. And so, you know, if I, if I had a bigger matrix, I would have more elements in this, and I would have more taps in my uh, uh, equalizer. But the fact that I don't is what leads to, uh, the fact that I have fewer taps is what leads to some intersymbol interference, which was not suppressed. So that's because there were only three taps in our equalizer. So we have this channel. We found exactly what the coordinates were, uh, the coefficients were for this three tap zero forcing equalizer. And now let's look at the performance. Well, in general, we can look at the performance of a zero forcing um, uh, equalizer by looking at what's going on in the frequency domain. Because we know that in the frequency domain, we're getting some enhancement of the noise. Okay, so there are some areas in some frequency bands where my zero forcing equalizer is multiplying those frequency content to be higher. And part of that frequency content is going to be noise. And so that noise is being increased. Uh, and here is the um, frequency domain representation of my equalizer based on what were the coefficients I used. So if I look at that 
frequency domain representation of what's going on with the zero forcing equalizer, I can quantify how much is the noise increased by passing through this equalizer. And that is um, this uh, noise level after the equalizer, which is got, given here. This first term is related to the signal to noise ratio before the equalizer. And if we were to plug this into the noise level into the uh, BPSK um, bit error rate representation, we would see this term here, the summation, come out as a penalty to the signal to noise ratio. I'm reducing the signal to noise ratio by this amount. So once I know the coefficients, I can see what impact uh, it has on the uh, final performance I'm going to get from this uh, equalizer. So in particular, if I return now to our numerical example and I do the sum over the uh, coefficients in this one, I would arrive at a figure of 1.78 dB uh, noise enhancement or a SNR penalty uh, based on uh, this system and this equalizer used to deal with this system. So I have managed to zero out ISI in the most, where it used to be the worst, in the, the closest in, but in doing that I have enhanced the noise. And remember, if I look at the frequency domain, I can see how I'm enhancing the noise. Remember, here is my channel, H of F. I transmit it, my signal gets transmitted, goes through the channel, I arrive at my electronic receiver. My electronic receiver, it's got thermal noise because it's got electronics in it. So it's got noise added to the signal, and of course this introduced ISI. And so now I try to find the inverse of that channel. Zero forcing would be just the exact inverse of this channel. But this inverse is now acting on the noise. So if the noise was flat to begin with, at the top of this uh, yellow curve, we can see that we're adding on to it uh, in certain sections. So we can see that these areas are going to see the noise increased by passing through the equalizer. And it's right when the signal's kind of weak. So the signal to noise ratio is, is not uh, uniform across the uh, um, signal. Well, I could always define it to be across the whole signal, but, but still. In inverting the channel, I have enhanced the noise. And that is why I end up with this uh, penalty for the uh, noise enhancement. Now let's look at uh, this channel, uh, which has uh, deep fades. Well, in the ones of the deep fades, zero forcing equalizer is not even going to be able to find an inverse because you know I'm dividing by zero so I can't really find an inverse so that would be ill-defined it's like I could truncate it, approximate it as being like really low but not zero but I'm still going to uh, have severe noise enhancement when I try to push things up when there's no no signal so in conclusion the zero forcing equalizer is involves simple calculations Right? It's just a tap delay line, very simple structure, and the um, uh, calculations have to be made are reasonable. We have an inverted matrix, it's Toplitz matrix, that helps. Um, it's very effective for high signal to noise ratio. If my signal is very strong, my noise is very low, the fact that I'm enhancing it doesn't matter. In fact, if there is no noise, it's like the ideal linear equalizer would be the zero forcing one. The problem is when there is noise. <laughs> so the signal to noise ratio, there's a penalty associated using the zero forcing. And of course we saw that the zero forcing equalizer does not exist for all channels. Channels with severe fades, with nulls, uh, really the zero forcing equalizer doesn't exist. And in the case of some of these channels where uh, there are deep fades, maybe not completely to zero, but those channels will have very high loss uh, when we try to implement the zero forcing equalizer. So let's go on with a couple more examples for zero forcing. In this case, I want to take three different channels to try to give you a feeling for how zero forcing is going to work in different environments. So there are three channels. Down here at the bottom, I've got the impulse responses. You have the number of uh, taps on each one of this tap delay line model of the channel and then I have plotted up here the frequency response so I just go into MATLAB take all these coefficients and plot the FFT of them. Um, 
you might think that, oh, the blue has got lots of longer memory, it's got lots of, you know, taps in it. But when I look in the blue, well, when I look in the frequency domain, I'm thinking, man, this channel doesn't look too bad. It's pretty flat, and it dips a bit at the end, but not too much. So this, when I look there, when I say, when I'm going to find the inverse of this, it's not going to enhance the noise too much. Then I look at that pink one, the third one, channel C, and I say, oh boy, here's this deep null. When I try and find the zero forcing equalizer, I'm going to get some terrible results in that null. Uh, so I'm thinking I'm going to have trouble with that. Red, well, it looks a little better, but it also goes here. You can think about this null as maybe just as deep as this one. So uh, when I'm looking here at the impulse response, it's hard for me to tell what's going on, which is why we uh, really turn to the interpretation of forcing it to be ISI zero as being the equivalent of inverting the channel. Uh, channel frequency response, because inverting the channel frequency response, we get a lot more intuitions what's going on. So, find the inverse of the channel, force the ISI to zero. They're saying the same thing. Just one is s describing what's going on in the uh, time domain, the other one is describing what's going on in the frequency domain. So those are our two interpretations of the zero forcing equalizer. And of course, the idea of inverting the channel, we can uh, uh, see in this uh, illustration. Performance. So here I put up here the colors, which channel is which, and you can see that on the uh, blue channel uh, I get a pretty good bit error rate. It looks like it's pretty close to the uh, uh, eliminating all of the ISI. Uh, here there might be a little penalty, but it's probably not very big. But we can see there's a big penalty for um, both of those channels. And it seems like the one with the null at lower frequencies is a little bit worse, but they're both pretty bad, and we can see here what the penalty is uh, for these uh, channels.